Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome. It's week six of the GeoPython course, and I think, uh, let's see here, we're trying to sort out whose screen is going to be shared. Maybe I, I will uh, take control here for just a second. Yeah, good morning, and apologies for sharing too much information. Um, yeah, so if you haven't already done so, you will find that we have another set of uh, responses that are posted here in the poll. You can go to the poll yourself and add your comments about our experience last week working with, with pandas. And uh, we'll continue with that a bit this week. Last week, we basically got our introduction to using pandas, how to read and write data in files. And uh, then we did some exploration of our data. So please feel free to add your comments here. I think now I have put the, the view of the questions in such a way that we can't see the, um, the URL for the poll that was visible earlier. I think I did something here in the controls to make the text larger. And uh, now we can't see the, the poll URL. But um, we could maybe put that once more in the chat, I guess. If uh, Volko doesn't mind to put that to chat, then we will have the poll link there if you haven't added your comments already. And uh, yeah, while we're while we're here, let's take a look at what we've heard so far from week five. We've got a pretty good amount of material to try to cover this week. So um, we'll go over these questions and, and comments here somewhat briefly and then try to launch our way into the lesson without too much delay. Um, but let's just take a quick look here. So pandas is very useful and fairly simple. That's a nice thing to see. And I think that's the whole idea with pandas is it's meant to make it easy for you to interact with data files. Uh, Vuoco, I know, is a, an avid pandas user. I'm a sort of pandas imposter. I don't know. I use it sometimes. Um, but uh, I think it's a, yeah, it is a very useful library. And I'm, I'm personally appreciating it more and more as I use it more. Um, it looks like there was a question here more specifically about trying to figure out uh, an issue related to the number of unique stations in the data frame and uh, that it would be useful to have the right answers to the questions in, uh, in the exercises so you know when you have something right. We've been trying to deal with this issue for a few years now. It's a challenging thing because in principle, the system we use for the automated grading could allow you to check your solutions, but it doesn't work with all of the different pieces we have like using GitHub Classroom. So we haven't found a good solution yet for that. Um, and we do appreciate the, the comment here. In general, what I would say is you are more than welcome to post something in Slack, for instance, like, you know, we think we got the right answer, but we're not sure, could you, let us know like is this is this right or is uh, you can send a direct message to one of the assistants or to uh, Vuoco or myself or you could just post a question in the general slack for that week if you're wondering whether or not you have the right answer because for the most part I think we really don't care about like trying to hide what the correct solution is as noted in the, the question here that you know you would come up with the code to get the right answer but it's always nice to know whether or not you have gotten the right solution and uh, I think we understand that one. So please feel free for the time being, if you have questions about whether or not you have the right answer to just to ask a question in Slack. I think maybe that's the best thing, unless Volko, do you have another opinion about this one or idea? Yeah, I totally agree. So if you're confused, do ask. And as Dave said, we have the automatic tests are there for this purpose and we can always also improve those or as, as said in here in the last comment, just to mention what is the expected output. So thanks. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah. Okay. Um, a couple other things. Looks like people are generally happy and seeing good things from last week, enjoying the exercises. Uh, the last task was quite hard to get your head around. Yeah, that's a definitely a more challenging task. And we have an optional task in this week's exercise as well. It's maybe not quite of the same type, but it allows you another opportunity to get different data than what we've provided for you and interact with it there. Looks like Poco has uh, maybe something yes. to add. So uh, as a nice news, so we will be learning the kind of 
techniques that were needed for the optional task last week during this lesson. So those of who you tried it, um, you kind of, kind of got a head start for trying to wrap your head around the grouping and aggregating process. So we'll be we'll be going through those examples today. And uh, yeah, otherwise, I think the only other thing I see, um, yeah, it doesn't have to be automatic grading, just the right answer should be to, yeah, I mean, that's something that we could, we try to do that in a sense with some of the tests to say that if you're te passing this test, then you have the right answer. Uh, but it's, in some cases, you're right, we could perhaps even just mention something that you should for the first you know, three values in your data frame for this column should be this so that you know you're on the right track. Uh, the only other thing I see here that's uh, a question that we could perhaps just spend a moment on at the moment, or well, currently, uh, would be about this difference between and and the ampersand. So we have this difference between uh, these two different ways of having multiple conditions. And, uh, and why does pandas only use ampersand? That's a question that is something maybe we can expand a little bit more on in Slack because it'll take us a little while to explain it, but it basically is the difference between how the data is represented. Um, and in pandas, essentially we're using a uh, under the hood, a NumPy array where we need to use this ampersand operation to do a bitwise comparison between each of the values in the array, one to the other, not comparing the entire array um, to itself and uh, or to another array. I think for the moment, I don't want to try to explain that in any more detail. I could certainly demonstrate some things here, but uh, someone had asked also in Slack about this earlier, and I found um, at least one article that seemed like it provided somewhat of an explanation, but it's the difference between doing a bitwise operation in which uh, it's literally comparing individual values in the arrays to one another versus comparing the entire thing. Um, and you notice if you try to use this and instead of the ampersand, you'll get a message that says it's not clear what you're trying to do. And, uh, and that's part of the reason the ampersand is it's clear that you're trying to do a sort of one to one comparison between values in your your column or your array if you're thinking about things in terms of NumPy, which we have not seen, so you don't need to worry about. Uh, Vorkal, I don't know if you have anything more to say about that. Yeah, maybe just you can, mem at this point, you can memorize that when doing these conditions on pandas columns, so indeed we're comparing one panda series to another panda series and the result of the kind of condition is a panda series with true false values. So in that case, we need this bitwise at sign or ampersand. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think maybe that's it for right now. But yes, thanks again for those who filled things in on the poll. It's always great to see things like partners that are working well together. Um, very pleased to, to see that still being the case. And with that, let's jump here then. So as you know, we're on to week number six, which means we're into lesson number six. And in this lesson, we're going to be talking about a little bit more stuff in pandas, a bit more data analysis using the pandas library. Uh, we're going to put our pandas skills to work in terms of also reading in a group of files in the, the lesson for this week. And uh, I think this lesson is a kind of fun one because we'll actually do some slightly more heavy crunching of, of data. And we're also going to talk a little bit about some other things that we've been encountering in some places, but not really dealing with in much detail, like error messages that come up when we're using Python and how to understand the error messages, as well as a few tips about debugging your Python code that might help with um, speeding up your process when you're trying to figure out what's wrong in your code. Okay, so that's where we're headed. And if you are Already looking at the web page, you'll see our main lesson here is about data processing with pandas 2. If you're using the CSC notebooks for this lesson, I would encourage you to use the GeoPython Lite uh, blueprint. The reason being is we're going to download some data files to work with on this exercise. And if you use the regular GeoPython, it's possible you'll fill up the storage space that's available. It's not that much. And I think we've got about um, 
a few hundred megabytes at least of data to download. And uh, I do recall last year that people filled up their, their space in the GeoPython instance. But if you use the GeoPython Lite, you should be OK, because uh, essentially there's nothing hardly at all there to begin with. I already have opened up my, my instance here. But again, yes, if you're using the CSC notebooks, uh, you can open that up, get yourself up and rolling here, and we'll be working in the notebooks L6 directory for lesson six. And then our notebook here is called Advanced Data Processing with, uh, with Pandas. Of course, we're not really super advanced, but advanced for our, our current uh, state of things. And the motivation for the lesson just in general, and while people are maybe getting their instances launched and things like that, uh, is from data from last year, April 2019, where it was observed that uh, globally it was one of the warmest Aprils on record. And in 13 locations in Finland, we had the record for the warmest April since those stations had, uh, had been operating. And obviously, if you look here, you can see in other countries, they've also had very similar anomalously warm weather. We could actually do the same exercise uh, of looking at the anomalously warm weather with the data we could find for January 2020. So I'll just show this quickly that, uh, as you may know, we had a rather poor winter, including a record temperatures in January. So this is just an article from the, the Meteorological Institute's webpage uh, talking about the anomalously high temperatures. Um, I mean, January was generally seven to eight degrees milder than usual. That's certainly quite um, anomalous, but it's not limited to Finland. It's actually something that was seen across much of Europe uh, and in some places even worse in terms of the deviation from normal temperatures than it was here. And uh, so we can come back to that later in the lesson, but just in case you're wondering, this is something that uh, we can certainly use other data for. What we have though is data from April, 2019, second warmest April on record. And what we're going to do is we're gonna take a look at this data and test and see with weather station data from various weather stations in Finland, whether or not we find April, 2019 to be the warmest on record. So we're gonna, involved in this process do a number of different things. We're going to rename some columns in our, our data file. We haven't done that previously. So we're going to read in data and then we're going to rename some of the columns. We're also going to go through our data frame and use functions on the values inside the data frame to convert values from one column to another. We're going to do some data aggregation. So we have, for instance, um, I think the Temperature data that we're going to be dealing with here is uh, it's uh, daily or maybe even more frequently than daily uh, values. And we're going to want to get those into being monthly values. So that's our data aggregation step. If we want to look at the warmest Aprils, we need to be able to calculate things like the average temperature in April for different years. And then we'll, at the end, do a repetition of this for many different data files. To get started, we're going to again be working with data from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association from the US from their database. So depending on what data files you're working with, you'll either have 15 or four different weather observation stations uh, and files for those different observation stations uh, in Finland. First step for us, though, is going to be to download the data. We're going to use this tool called wget. And that will allow us to download our data file. And I'll show you how to do this. Uh, for those on the CSC Notebooks platform, we're going to be working in the terminal. I guess if you're working on your, your own machine as well, you'd be working in the terminal. It's not really recommended to use Binder for this exercise, uh, for this lesson, rather. Uh, so hopefully, you're able to work in CSC Notebooks or on your own, own machine. But uh, if we are here in the CSC Notebooks, system like this, I'm going to go here to file and then new and open a new terminal because we need to download our data in the terminal window. 
I'm also going to take my little terminal window tab. I'm just going to grab that and drag it down here to the bottom half of the window so that I can see the lesson up here and see my terminal down here. If I just type the command ls, that's going to list the files in the current directory. And I can see, for instance, now my notebooks directory. And I can basically just type what's shown here, cd, which will change directories, notebooks slash l6. So yeah, how to open a terminal. Again, it's just if you go to file, new, and then terminal, if you're in Jupyter Lab. Yeah, as Volko says in the, in the chat. OK, so I've typed here now what was in the first line, cd notebooks slash l6. And if I type ls now, I can see some files in here. So I have my advanced processing with pandas, debugging, and some other files that are here, as well as an image directory and a metadata directory. Now, since I can see that stuff, it tells me I'm in the right directory, which means I'm also then able to download the data file to this directory. If you're working using the GeoPython Lite blueprint, you can basically just copy this thing here from above and paste it into the terminal. So wget is a command that will just go and uh, pull files from a web address. In this case, it's going to go to a, a data that's hosted in my personal GitHub um, repository. And in this case, we've got this archive of files called Finland weather data full.tar.gz. That's just a compressed archive of files, kind of like a zip file. And if you press enter and run that command, you should hopefully see the data download relatively quickly. The total size in this case is 81 megabytes for this file. And then when we extract things, it'll get a little bit bigger. So if you've been able to download the file, um, you should then be able to run this next command, which is you can again, just copy and paste. This is using a utility called tar, which is a, some kind of archiving utility. And then these letters here are going to unzip extract and then use verbose output. And then F will be indicating the file name that should be having those operations. And that's our data file that we just downloaded. So you can just copy paste that and hit enter. You'll see some messages here about unknown uh, extended header keywords. Don't worry about that stuff. Uh, I think I archived these files on my, my Mac computer. And when you do that on a Mac, for some reason, it, uh, it gives some extra stuff that the, the CSC notebooks machines can't understand. So if you're extracting this on a Mac, you might not see these things, but you can just not worry about these uh, extended, her extended header uh, warning messages. They're not of any significance to us. What I'm going to do at this point is, uh, while this thing is extracting, I'm going to suggest that um, if you're working with this data already, perhaps you could let me know with a green check mark in the participants list when you've been able to download and extract the files. And the way to know whether you've extracted the files uh, properly is if you do ls um, and then data, our files are going to be extracted to a directory called data. If you type ls space data and you see output that looks like this, then everything has gone well and you could put a green check mark. If you're having problems, you can either comment in the chat or you can put a red check mark and then perhaps Fuoco will be able to give you some, some assistance. So now I'll just say a little bit about the data files that we have. There's a number of files that we've downloaded, including metadata about these uh, data files. So in most cases, you will have downloaded 15, uh, 15 stations worth of, of weather data. And um, we'll have here, for instance, in this data file uh, that I can click on here, 
This is our metadata that describes which stations we have. I think, unfortunately, maybe I can hide this uh, file browser thing. Just click on the little file browser if you also want to hide that. Makes it easier for this us to read. But here you can see the 15 stations we're working with um, that are kind of all across um, Finland, including stations up in Lapland, but also stations like the Turku and, of course, uh, some also from Helsinki Vanta. So we have 15 different stations. You can see the latitude, longitude, and elevation of the stations here. So this is one of our metadata files. Just tells us which stations we have and gives us some basic information about them. Another one of our data files here is detailing the information. It's essentially, I think, like an inventory of the data that we have downloaded. So for instance, for the Sorankula, station we have data starting in 1917 and i believe then every one of the numbers in the columns here is the number of observations in this case it would be number of temperature observations for each month so it should be january february march april may june july august september october november december yep there's our 12 months and of course you can see for instance in 1917 that the number of observations we have is smaller than it is later on and this number of observations tends to grow with most stations where now there's something like 740 observations per month. But this is a nice way for us to see overall um, how much data we have. And you can also then easily identify cases where, for instance, in Kuusamo, we had data from 1909 to 1915, and then a pretty big hiatus. And then we start to get more data starting in 1957. So this inventory tells us essentially how much data we have overall. And if you scroll down through it, you can see for each one of the stations what kind of data we have. Oops. Uh, and I don't need to save my changes. Finally, there's a data description. So this is a, a metadata file um, that's probably the most common thing that you're going to want to take a look at. And that is telling us something about the different weather conditions. I don't know, for instance, here, if I scroll up to the top, this is telling us about what each column in our data file contains and, uh, and an explanation of what these different things mean. So alt means altimeter setting in inches to the nearest hundredth, uh, whatever the weather observation data is that we, that we need. So we would know that then the SD column is the snow depth in inches and uh, then you can see for certain things there may be some additional data for instance numbers that are used to represent various weather conditions so that's our metadata if we look at one of the data files itself a data file that would be uh, here i think i don't know which station this is for but here's the first five lines of one of the the data files where we can see for instance here some basic information identifying the station here's something about the the time at which the observation is collected so this is 1906 in the first of january at six o'clock in the morning and then for the various columns we have here things like temp that's hopefully one that looks familiar um, for the the temperature that was measured in that data file so we're going to develop our set of steps to look through multiple stations by working with a single data file first. And um, in order to do that, of course, we're going to be working with pandas. So we need to import pandas. And we can do that with import pandas as PD. I'm going to go ahead and drag my terminal window back up to the, to the top bar here so it's out of the way. And uh, import pandas as PD, run that cell. That'll import our pandas library. We're going to take a look at one of these data files, 029440. So this is Tampere Pirkala, uh, is the station we're working with. And we're going to read this data file in, but you may have already noticed looking at the format of the data, that this is a little bit of a funky data format. For one thing, we don't have comma separated values here. We have spaces between our columns. In some cases, there's one space. In some cases, there are several spaces. So this data file is a little bit harder for us to read in. In addition, the no data values here are indicated with asterisks. 
And depending on the width of the column, there might be one, there might be two, there might be three, four, five, uh, I think as many as maybe six asterisks that would indicate missing data. We're gonna have to handle that when we read in our data file. So in this case, our delimiter, the thing that's separating our different columns, instead of being commas as we have used previously, is white space or spaces. And one nice thing in Pandas is that we have the possibility to use this delim white space equals true, which indicates that spaces between the columns should be used as a delimiter. And it actually could be a varying number of spaces, which is handy. We don't have to worry about handling that special case of multiple spaces between the columns. So when we read in our data file, we're gonna to have to use this delim white space equals true parameter. And in addition, our no data values, we have different numbers of these asterisks. And we can handle this by saying that our NA values are values that should be treated as no data. And that that's equal to here, a list of different things. So here we have in our list first one asterisk, then two, three, four, five, and six. So anytime one of these values is encountered in a column, it's gonna be converted to no data. So that's what should happen when we read the data file in here, we can define our file path. Uh, again, the R is indicating that it's the raw uh, string for the file path. And all you have to do is just run this cell if you are working in the CSD notebooks. And it may take a moment, it's gonna read the data file in. And uh, it's now giving me a warning about the, the memory, but I think everything should hopefully be okay. Let's, uh, let's hope that's the case. It also complains about a couple columns in the data file. But we've read our data into a data frame called data. And if we do data.head here, we can take a look at the first five lines of our data file. And you'll see things look more or less like what we expect. We can see, for instance, that we have properly read in the data in terms of the spacing. It's found the columns as we expect. And also that there are a bunch of NAN values in here indicating our missing data has properly been converted to the expected NAN values. And we can see here, for instance, we now have 33 columns as the total number of columns in our data file. As it turns out, since we're at best amateurs in terms of dealing with uh, climate data, or at least that's as, as far as I'm willing to uh, qualify things, I, I would call myself an amateur. There's a lot of these columns that aren't going to matter for our purposes. So if we look at our data.columns, this is the names of all the different columns that we have. And most of these we don't really need to use for our analysis because we're really interested in looking at how temperature has varied, how temperature might be anomalous in April of 2019. And as a result, things like the dew point, uh, the wind speed and direction, they aren't really as important to us as some other things. Although maybe we'll read some of them in just to, to have them. Um, but there's a lot of things in here that, that we don't need. What it means is we're gonna reread our data file. And again, you should see that you have this uh, already filled in cell here, where what we're gonna do is we'll do the same thing we did before, delimit the white space. We're gonna use uh, the same NA values that we had before, but now we're gonna pass also this use calls parameter to pandas to say we only want certain columns and the certain columns we want are the six or seven that we have here. I guess maybe it's, maybe it's actually eight columns. But this will then mean that instead of having 33 columns, we should end up with eight. And if you just run this cell, it will again read the data file in and the data.head command at the end of the cell prints that back out to the screen and we can see the columns that we expect now. So we have simplified things quite a bit. We've got our temperature column, that's gonna be an important one. There's max and min temperatures as well. I don't see any in the first five lines of our data file, but they do exist elsewhere. There's just a lot of NAN values in between them. All right, now we've read these in, but as you can probably tell already, at least for people like me, some of these column headings are kind of confusing, like this Yermo de Herman uh, column is something it's indicating date information, but maybe we can think of renaming this to something slightly more intuitive in order to make it easier for us to understand the data that's in our data frame. So if we check the columns that we have in the current one, 
again, we have only these eight. And what we're going to do is we're going to use something called a Python dictionary to rename the columns. A dictionary is something that is a structure in Python where you would store what's called the key value pair. And with the key value pair, essentially what we can do is something like we could say that our key might be one of these values or one of these uh, strings of text here. So our key could be something like dir. And then we could have a value that's associated with that so that when we go to replace it, if it finds dir, it will replace it with the value that is listed. It's easiest perhaps to demonstrate this with an example of, uh, of a dictionary. So let's make a dictionary here called new names. Dictionaries in Python are indicated with the curly brackets. So we're going to say new names equals and then curly brackets. And we are going to rename our year mode -herm column. So that's yr dash dash mode -herm. In case you haven't figured it out already, this is year, month, day, hour, minute. And the way it works in a Python dictionary is you would have whatever some string or some value here, and then colon, and then the associated value. So the key, and then the value that we want to use for the renaming, and we'll just call this time. Now, just like we could do, for instance, in a Python list, we can do more than one of these key value pairs in a single dictionary. So we could also do SPD and rename that to be speed. And also, finally, we could rename Gus to Gust. So this is our dictionary, it has three different entries in it. And the key and values that are associated with them are defined with these colon characters. And then if we just add down here our variable that we've just created, our dictionary new names, we can run this cell. And we see basically the output that we just entered looks very similar. And if we check the type of new underscore names, you'll see that it's a dict. So this is a Python dictionary. And these dictionaries can be really useful for lots of different purposes. But essentially, normally what you're doing is you want to substitute some value with another value. And it's an easy way to do that kind of thing. So let's change the names of these columns. And we can do that using a pandas uh, method called rename. So we can say, for instance, here, data equals data dot rename. And then we give the parameter columns equals new underscore names. So columns is expecting a dictionary with key value pairs for things in here where the, the key should be some existing column name in the data frame. And the value that's associated with it would be the new name that's going to be used when this rename operation happens. So if we run this column, you can see that it's going to print out our data.columns at the end of the cell here. And now we see USAF, time, dir, speed, gust, temp, max, min. That's good. So our rename operation appears to have properly um, been implemented, and it's now made our data frame slightly easier to understand. Speaking of understanding, now it's your turn to do a little bit more practice here with the rename operation. So what you can do here is we're going to rename the column temp to be temp F. Why are we doing that? Well, as you can imagine, we've got temperatures in Fahrenheit again, and we'd like to convert those to temperatures in Celsius. And it's going to be perhaps a bit more clear to us as users if our temp column is called temp F to indicate the temperatures in Fahrenheit. In addition, we can rename this USAF to be station number. This is an identifier of the station number. And uh, we can make that a little bit more clear by doing that rename operation as well. So here you've got an opportunity in this box to do this renaming of the other additional two columns. And I'll go ahead and clear the check marks away. 
Once you've finished with this, check your understanding operation, renaming these extra columns, you can put a green check mark. And once we get a sufficient number of those, we will continue on with the lesson. All right, looks like we've got now almost the same number of people with green check marks as we had download the data to begin with. So that's good. Maybe we'll start uh, slowly working through the, the approach for this exercise or this part. And here, what we're going to do is basically what we just did above with creating a dictionary for the key and values that we want to do for our substitution. Then we'll do the rename operation using the pandas rename method. And then we'll check our data to see whether the expected results are there. You can call this whatever you want, um, but it's easiest if we just keep the same dictionary name that we had before, new names. As you remember, we're going to have our key be the existing column name, and then our value be temp f, for instance, for the first one. That's going to be the first substitution we want to do. And since we also want to do the conversion of USAF to station number, we can do that here as well. So that's our dictionary, temp as the key, temp F as the value, and USAF as the key, and station number as the value. That should substitute those two once we use that dictionary. In terms of how we're going to use it, again, we're going to say our data equals data dot rename and then the parameter we pass is called columns equals new underscore names or whatever you've just decided to use for the variable name up here for the new dictionary if you run this cell that should do it basically if we've properly created our dictionary the operation should be hopefully fairly painless and you can see here for instance now our station number uh, has been renamed as well as our temp has been converted to be called temp F and that's more clear and that's a good thing. So hopefully um, you follow that. If you didn't, you can always check the course webpage where you can find the solution for this check your understanding as well. Now let's take a quick look at our data properties. We can first explore, see what we've loaded into our data file by looking at the number of rows and columns we have. So if we do data.shape, that's our uh, attribute that contains information about how big our data file is. And in this case, you can see we've got a pretty decent size data file. Um, ah, yeah, okay. Volko is giving a hint if you've happened to have extracted your data to the wrong directory uh, of how to deal with that. But here we have 757,000 almost 756 or 758,000 lines of data, rows of data, and eight columns. We've got a lot of data now that we're dealing with. And obviously, this is something you're not going to want to process by hand. If we take a look at the top of the data file. We can do data.head like we did earlier. We can see, for instance, some information here, like our time indicating that our first observations from 1906. We do data.tail. That gives us the end of the file. And so we can see, for instance, our latest observation was from 2019 in the month of October on the 1st of October. And here it looks like it was at 11.50 uh, PM, the time this observation was made. And you can see from our index values, the total number of data that we have in the file, total number of rows of data. The data types for the columns, we can check by doing data.dtypes. If we run that, we can see what we have. We have station numbers and time that are both represented as integer whole number values. Yes, that looks to be the case. And everything else is a floating point value. And yes, that also looks to be correct. As we would expect, our temperature is going to be floating point value as, uh, as that would make sense. Finally, if we look at our descriptive statistics, we can do this with the data.describe method. If you run that, just by typing data.describe and hitting shift enter or clicking the play button, you'll get information here about 
a whole bunch of things as we've already seen last week. So we can see things that in some cases make sense, mean values, for instance, we can see average temperatures of 40.4 degrees Fahrenheit for this location. But the thing it's perhaps uh, worth noting is if we look, for instance, at the count value, that's how many rows of data we have for each one of these columns, you'll notice there are some columns like min and max that have many fewer values than, for instance, temp F. So temp F, we have something like 754,000 uh, observations of temperature, but the min and max temperature, we only have about 23,000. So many, not a number of values in those columns. So that's a useful thing you can see from the data.describe right away. Now, I think this is about the point where I'm going to hand things over to Vuoco if she wants to take over, or I can continue through at least defining this function. I don't know what, uh, what are your thoughts on this, Vuoco? Would you like to take things from here? Okay, I'm going to go ahead with the function still, as, uh, as noted in chat. All right, so our next operation is going to be converting our data from temperatures in Fahrenheit to temperatures in Celsius. We've done this several times now already, so hopefully it's not getting boring to you. We haven't done this yet in a, in a pandas data frame, so we're going to see how to use functions that we've written to modify the data within our data frame. And we're going to first do that using a for loop, then we're going to go on to um, an example of how to do things using a method we haven't used called data.apply. First thing we need to do is define our function for converting our values from Fahrenheit to Celsius. You can do that here quite easily by just running this cell and you've already created this function in the past. So we really don't need to spend a great deal of time talking about how it operates. Essentially, all we do is take in some temperature and we calculate a converted temperature and return that value from the function. All you have to do is run the cell. Just to make sure everything looks good, we can take our function far to Celsius give it some value that we know, like 32 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the temperature at which water should freeze. And we know that in Celsius, that should be zero. And if we run our function with that value of 32, we get the expected value of zero. So that's good news. It looks like the function's working. If you wanted to, you could also run it with 212 degrees and you should get 100 degrees for the Celsius temperature in that case, being the boiling point of water at, uh, at sea level. And last thing we can do here before we proceed is just to do data.head once more, just to see what our data frame looks like at the moment. Now, what we're going to do at this stage is going to show you two different methods for how you can use a function and go through and use that function to convert values in your data frame from or basically to be applied to some values in your data frame, in our case, converting from temperature in Fahrenheit to temperature in Celsius. The first method is going to use something called iter rows, which will go kind of row by row through doing some calculation. The second method uses a uh, method in pandas called apply. And we'll show you this first one iterating over the rows just for the sake of seeing the simple case of going row by row and how you would do something if you want to do it really on a row by row basis. But this is slow and it's generally not recommended. So the apply that we show after this is going to be more useful and more uh, something it's, it's encouraged more by the pandas user community. And maybe that would be a good thing um, to just know about this iter rows, but that using apply is the, the better way to go. Uh, I will ask once again, Vuoco, do you want to take things from here or shall I go through iterating over the rows? Well, I can also do it if, if, if you're not prepared for it, but yeah. It doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'll, I can hand things off with apply so you can look like the superstar who knows how to do the, the fast way and <laughs> how to do things in a smart way. Yeah, yeah, go ahead while, I'll, I'll while show you're the, ready. I'll show the bad example. Um, Okay, so what we have here is a method that's going to allow us to go through row by row and, and do something. 
so we could use it to apply a function. We could use it, do it to do other things as well. But essentially what we're going to have is a for loop for each row. And with our for loop, this data.iter rows, as you can see here already, is going to access the data from a single row. And it'll give us the data from that row as a variable called row. It's actually going to be a pandas series. And then the index for that row will also be returned from this iter rows function. So we have both the index and the data for that row in our uh, in our for loop. And so we're able to access both of those things at once. If, for instance, you just run this cell, you'll see that the index 0 has, in this case, a value of temp f. So in our for loop, we're printing out index and then the value of idx. That's our index equal to 0. Then we print out temp f. And then we have here our row. Remember, this is a pandas series uh, with the data for this row. And then it says temp underscore f. That's just the value from that row that we want to look at. And you can see, for instance, 27 degrees. We look back up here at our first line of our file. Sure enough, the index is 0. And the temperature for that first line is 27 degrees, as expected. There's also then here something we haven't seen before. It's a break. Um, and this break statement is something that just says when you encounter this point either in a for loop or in something like a conditional statement, just bail out from what you're doing in the for loop and stop. So rather than iterating through every single one of the rows that we have here, the break statement allows us to just do this once, check that things are giving us the output we expect, and then stop. That's a handy thing to be able to do, especially if you're going to have a data file with something like uh, more than 700,000 lines of output. You want to perhaps check and see that things work for a single case before proceeding through doing all of the different cases. All right. Now, let's move on to how we can use this for the example we want to look at here, which is to fill in the column of temperatures in Celsius. The first thing we're going to do for this operation when we want to use the iter rows method, um, actually, you know what, before we do that, let me just do one thing here. I'm just going to add an extra cell just to show you that uh, if we look at the output from what row is after our for loop has gone through th here the first time, you can see that this is a pandas series with all the different values for the different columns listed here in the series. So that's why we can access row temp F and get our temperature of 27 degrees that way. We could get anything else we wanted as well for that single row in that way. So the row will contain all the values for that row of data. And uh, yeah, as that was just explained, what we need to do now if we're going to create a column of values that includes this temperature in Celsius is we can first start by just creating an empty column of zeros for the temp C variable that we'll use to store our temperature in Celsius. So we can just do data and then, uh, oops, um, temp C in quotation marks. That's our uh, new column name. And we're going to set all the values in that new column to be equal to zero. And uh, yeah, Volko has already giving you kind of heads up that the, the next operation is going to be a little bit slow when you run it. Don't worry about that. It takes maybe 10 seconds or something like that, possibly a little bit longer. It's not super bad. Uh, actually, it's going to be longer with this uh, bigger data file. But anyway, so we've created our empty column here called temp C. That's just there as a place for us to be able to store our values of uh, temperature Fahrenheit when it's converted. Then we're going to have a for loop just like we did before. So for IDX, comma row in data.iter rows. So this is going to allow us to go through every single row in our data file. We're going to first convert the temperature from Fahrenheit to Celsius. We'll do that by doing far to Celsius, our function, on the value at row of temp f. So that should be the temperature and Fahrenheit value for the current row that we're working on in the data file. That's going to be converted to Celsius and stored as a variable called Celsius. So far, so good. Then what we want to do is we want to use data.at. So this is going to allow us to access a specific location in our data frame. And the location is going to be our 
value or our location uh, with index IDX. Hey, that's handy. So whatever row we're working on, we're going to go to the same place, the same row in our data frame. So data uh, at index IDX. And then the column would be temp C, and we're going to set the value in that column equal to, to Celsius. So I'm going to start this running just by pressing shift enter while it runs. Um, we can sit here and think of how this is maybe not the most efficient way to do things. You'll find out when Volko takes over that their apply method is a lot faster, but uh, this is allowing us to go through row by row, split things up and, and interact. So there are some cases where you may want to process your data row by row. It's not normally the case that you want to do that, but you can. Anyway, all that's happening here is we're just looping over all the different rows in the file. We grab a given row that'll be stored as the variable row as a pandas series. Then we're able to take the temperature in Fahrenheit in that row, convert it to Celsius and store that as the variable Celsius, and then go back into the data frame at the location of the index for where we are in the for loop. And then in the column called temp C, we just fill that in with the value of the temperature in Fahrenheit that's been converted to Celsius. So this is now finished. It didn't take too long, um, but we can now just have a quick look at our data.head to see how things are looking. And now if we look, we have our temp F. And over here, we also have a column called temp C. And just taking a quick look at these numbers, the temperatures of 27 to 25, 26 degrees Fahrenheit are just slightly below freezing. And as expected, we have temperatures then in Celsius that look like they are compatible and also slightly below freezing. There's a little reminder here about using data.loc and data.at. In this case, we're using data.at because it's faster to access a specific row, um, but there are more than one uh, possibility for for doing this. If you need to get a single value in a data frame, data frame dot at is the faster way to do that. And uh, so that's the kind of general approach and perhaps the sort of slow approach for how to apply a function to uh, to our data, not using the apply method, but using this iter rows approach. And now Volko is going to take over here and uh, walk us through applying a function. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just take a second here while we switch over. Or shall I continue sharing my screen and yes, I can. I'm on it. As long as I share the correct screen this time. <laughs> uh, just a second. There we go. I hope you can see my Jupyter lab and nothing else. Um, in here. So I'll, I'll take over from here. I'll go maybe for 10 minutes to wrap up this first section before we take a coffee break um, and then continue. So we now um, have applied the function row by row as Dave now showed using this iter rows. Um, there are many useful things in here, even though it's not the most efficient approach as, as Dave said. So somebody already asked asked why do we have these two two variables in here and how how does pandas know that the first one is the index and the second one is the row if you go to the iter rows documentation you'll see that that's that's how this uh, function then gives us the data so there is uh, if we had only one one variable here it would be a tuple uh, and then then indeed we go to one row apply the data and then uh, add it back to the original uh, data frame. So if you understand what happens in this for loop, you basically understand quite well the structure of a pandas data frame. So for that, data rows is a good tool for kind of breaking the process, process into pieces. But as Dave advertised, uh, there are more advanced ways or, and more efficient ways of doing this as we are now kind of I would, wouldn't say that this is yet big data, but we have already rather large data files. And if, if we take, if it takes min, tens of minutes for us to wait for a function to be applied on each row uh, in a data frame, so that's, that costs time and is inefficient. So let's see how we can apply the function directly um, 
using this apply method. Mm. Uh, so, and using this, we could also then apply on each row as we did now, or apply apply uh, um, column col column wise uh, things. Maybe we could want to quickly see the documentation of pandas apply uh, just to get the official definition. Let's see. So indeed. Uh, if we do data frame dot apply, we pass the name of a function as a parameter, and then we can define uh, which way do we want to apply it. Uh, and this function that we pass, it can be an existing kind of existing function from some library, or then it can be a self self defined function, as we are doing in here. So we have this part Celsius uh, function in there. Uh, and if we want to repeat what we just did, uh, so to create uh, or convert these Fahrenheit temperatures, so we, we take that as the starting point, and then we apply uh, the method so far to Celsius. And here we pass the function name without the brackets. So in a way, what then happens here, at least how I think of it as a process, is that then Python does it in a more efficient way that it takes this function, takes the value uh, from this column, and then applies the function on uh, each value that it finds, finds in there. And then it returns as a series, uh, which we can see here printed out. And everything works. So then we can store the output of this apply command uh to the temp c column so now we overwrite overwrite the results that we created using the iter rows approach like this nothing should, should change but as you can see it now went uh in less than a second uh instead of instead of being slowly i think also with these kinds of um iterative structures then if you would still if we would for example print something out like we had in here so if you if you would take out the break from here and print everything out, so that might be even still slower. So it's always good, good to test test the process with a small small example or small set of data. Um, okay. So furthermore, uh, if you remember what columns we had in our data, so we temp Fahrenheit was not the only. Uh, Fahrenheit column, we also have these max and min columns that have Fahrenheit values, so we might want to apply the same function on several columns. Uh, and how to do that? Uh, we can take, again, a selection of the columns. Oops, now I have one too many of these. So a list of column names. Uh, we have, let's include temp f there. Uh, we can do it at the same time and then minimum value, maximum value, uh, and then apply bar to Celsius. There we go. So now, uh, at the same time, we apply this function on values uh, found in these columns. And then in a similar way, now you could imagine that we create a Kelvin conversion function and apply that, and so on and so forth. So just a little uh, wrap up. This should be easy, but now uh, your task would be to take basically what we did in here, uh, apply the conversion function from Fahrenheit to Celsius on these columns, and then store the output to new columns, temp C, min C, and max C. You should be able to do that with one line of code. Uh, so we will do this, and then let's see how much time it is if we take a break then or after the next topic. But please uh, do the conversion, create new columns, store the output there, and let me know with the green check marks one, once you are done with that. All right, so 
I would think of this problem uh, from the point of view of the output. So I want new columns, temp C, temp min C, and max C in my data frame. So I'll create a slot for those. So data and then list of columns, um, temp C, um, min C, and then max C. Okay, now I have the structure in place. And then what values will be in there? So it will be the values from temp f, min f, max f, uh, converted to Celsius. So then we have uh, the same syntax as before, temp f, uh, max, oops, case, no, case specific. Um, and need to be now careful because the order matters here if I'm doing it like this, um, and max. All right, uh, and then convert it to from Fahrenheit to Celsius with our function. So Python will first run this one and create uh, the converted values, a data frame, and then it will see that, okay, we want to assign the value of this data frame and these columns to these columns. And let's just double check. We have uh, the temperature, then minimum, and then maximum. Otherwise, we might overwrite wrong values. So that's how I would do it. Um, and then we can check a bit more rows of the data. Well, there's not now, if we would, I'll just sort, sort by um, exhort values by mean, let's see if we have some. So here you can then see, uh, see at least some values where there were values for the minimum. Uh, did that now go correctly? Something is now going off, but let's figure out that during the break. At least I need a coffee. Um, if somebody spotted what I did wrong in here, so please let me know. Let's come back uh, at 10.42. So we have big topics coming up. Uh, we have now learned to apply functions, hopefully in the correct way. I'll check if something was going wrong in my great example. Uh, and after the break, we will start grouping the data. As uh, you have noticed, we have this quite precise uh, measurements, even uh, to the minute. So we want to take averages uh, at the monthly level in, in order to detect, uh, detect uh, the monthly values. Yes, indeed. OK, so Ola was clever enough. We have actually made a mistake earlier in here, but I'll, I'll fix the code during the break and show you, show you the correct syntax. Maybe, maybe this quick sw switch of teachers without a break uh, causes, causes some uh, issues in, in the process. But yeah, let's take a break and come back in 10 minutes.